when you really are on stage and you're playing a concert and you are really in the zone, when you're really in that state of flow and you can feel that other people are there with you and it feels like everybody is there sort of simultaneously creating this thing of beauty that will only exist that one time in that one moment. It's the greatest. It's the greatest feeling. That's what I think we're all sort of striving for all the time, every day. Colorado in the United States and I grew up there. I started playing the violin at the age of eight, which is a bit late for violin, but I started because I needed to play for school. Um, and then when I was 12 years old, the Baroque Chamber Orchestra of Colorado was founded. Um, and I was in a place where I sort of didn't want to be playing violin because it wasn't cool at school. and. A lot of my friends were quitting lessons and I was like, ah, oh, that would, I want to quit playing the violin. Um, but then I saw this orchestra and I'd heard symphony orchestras, I'd heard concerts before and um, I'd always enjoyed them. I'd always enjoyed classical music, but I heard the Baroque Orchestra in Colorado and was totally obsessed. Um, I, like I'd never heard the sounds that they made. I'd ne I didn't know that classical music could sound the way that sounded. Um, and it really reached me. It really touched me in sort of a deep place. It really moved me. And yeah, I became obsessed. I started going to all of their rehearsals when I wasn't in school. Um, I would sit in the audience of whatever church they were rehearsing in and do my math homework or whatever. And then started going to all of their concerts. Like if they did the same concert three times throughout the weekend, I would go to every single one if I could. Um, and I really, I really wanted to, to play Baroque violin. I really wanted to do that. Um, in the States, especially at that time and in Colorado, that was really not an option. So I kept playing the modern violin. I picked up the Baroque violin for the first time when I was 16. Um, at the Baroque Performance Institute at Oberlin College in uh, in Ohio, um, which was a great experience, but it was you know a two week summer camp, um, and then yeah, then I studied modern violin through my bachelor's through my undergrad, and in Oregon, and then I I wanted to uh, really begin studying Baroque violin and. Um, I lived for a few months in Seattle doing that and a little bit of time in Toronto, but uh, I had a teacher in Toronto tell me that I really should consider moving to The Hague and studying um, at the conservatorium here. And so I did. I uh, It's sort of the place to go if you want to study Baroque music and it makes sense to do it in Europe. There are more options. There's more of a scene. There's more, there are more opportunities. Um, so I moved like uh, six and a half years ago now and studied. I did my master's here, um, studied for three years at the conservatory and then stayed because I have work. <laughs>
before I moved here, I I started playing with them as a trainee my second year living here. Yeah, my second year living here. And they, um, the way they think about music is also the way that I had always thought about music without really knowing it. Music has always been music to me. It, it, we put some artificial borders around it to try and explain things, but um, it never felt like those those boundaries and those borders were totally real or needed to be there or meant anything. I found that Holland Baroque really feels the same way, that music is music and um, it reaches people and it, it moves people and that uh, that can happen in whatever way it needs to. Um, and I, yeah, I was also really, I've learned a lot from them about the idea of needing to come to music every single day with fresh eyes. You can't rely on what you did yesterday. You can't rely on what the project sounded like last time you played it. Um, you have to start kind of at the same place every day with fresh new eyes, the, the idea of discovering something anew. And that newness needs to be there every day in order to create and to create music. hardest part there are, things are hard in different ways um I would say the sort of long-term uh sort of just physical exhaustion that can happen from you know from a tour when you're having to get up and fly on a plane every single day and then play a concert that night um that the sort of pacing of your energy and the finding finding the time to to do the work that you need to do to be able to show up and play that concert as well as you possibly can and it's yeah it is one thing to be able to prepare well, really well show up and play one concert and it's another thing to be able to really day after day keep up that same uh, level of musicianship and commitment and energy when it takes such a toll on you um, physically. I saw Irish dancers when I was two years old and said, I want to do that. Uh, and my parents were like, yeah, okay, uh, sure. And then they thought I would get over that and forget or something, I think. And I didn't. I kept asking. And so finally, that started when I was seven, seven years old. And I, yeah, was also quite obsessed with Irish dancing. It was sort of that and playing the violin were my main uh, things all the way through high school until I was 18. And then I had a broken foot from dancing and realized that I probably couldn't keep doing that the same way. Uh, so I let that one go a little bit more and started focusing more on the violin.
Yeah, it's true that my job and my work requires me to be around a lot of people a lot of the time. And which is something that I appreciate and enjoy. And I love the collaborative nature of what I do. I love that there's sort of a balance between practicing at home by myself for hours in my, you know, in my apartment or uh, being in a crowd, traveling on a train, on a plane or in rehearsal with a lot of other people, in a concert, on stage in front of a lot of people. Um, and I like that interaction. Uh, but then I also find that I really have a need to also be alone and uh, take time to reflect and check in with myself and sort of center myself again. And uh, that feels best and easiest to me if that can be out in nature somewhere. Um, it helps me feel like I'm more connected to the world and less important. Uh, I really, I like the feeling of being one tiny small part of this huge expansive universe. And so for instance, being by the sea, the feeling of that enormous sea out in front of me helps me feel small in a great way. And um, I think it's also partly tied to where I grew up. I grew up in a place right next to the Rocky Mountains. My backyard was a forest. It was a grove of aspen trees. And they grow in a grove where they're all connected by their roots. You will never find one alone um, because they, they all grow together as a community. And there was a grove of them with, uh, it was, they grew in a circle and there was an empty space in the middle of that circle. And I remember going as a very small child. We moved when I was five. So I guess it was before that I would go and sit by myself in the middle of that circle of trees and sit and think, I guess, um, daydream, imagine things. I think it really had a huge impact on my um, experience of nature and need to feel like a part of the world in that way. And it's easy to lose track of that when you live in a city. I'm always trying to find the right words to say something. My grandmother used to say that she was convinced I was going to be a writer when I grew up, which I, like has not happened at all. Uh, but somebody gave me a journal when I turned nine, I think. And I don't know what got me started writing in it, but I started journaling when I was nine and it's it's been something I've done ever since. Uh, it's not like, it's not that I write in order for anybody to ever read any of this stuff. That's like really not the point of it. Um, but I think it's another way of grounding myself and connecting. It's the, the other, you know, it's part of the reflection process. Uh, and sometimes I write more than other times, but it's also nice to have the, the record of all of that. Um, it's not that I go back and read them very often, but occasionally I will go back and see something from an old journal and it's a good reflection tool to be able to no, really remember how I was feeling at that time and reflect on how I, where I am now. There are still moments that I can't really believe my life has turned into what my life has turned into. Uh, when I was growing up and all the way, you know, living in the States, I didn't really know that this life here was possible this way. And it feels really still magical and special. And I do feel really grateful for being able to live my life the way I live my life. Um, 
Yeah, and the journal is a helpful reflection tool in that way. Um, yeah, I just found a, a letter that I wrote to my younger self. I wrote that letter in 2016, right after I'd moved here. I'd had a very hard year the year before that. And I had felt like I'd sort of gotten over a hurdle and that I was at the beginning of something new. And I wrote this letter, I it was on a plane, reflecting back on how how I felt as a kid and how I was feeling then and um, then a couple of little sentences wondering how I was going to be feeling in the future. I don't know. I think it's, it's helpful for me. November 25th, 2016. Dear me, I'm sitting on a plane right now on my way back to the Netherlands where I now live. I'm contemplating my life as often happens while on planes. I know you think you know where your life is headed, but there are so many things in store for you. You feel like a shy and anxious kid, but now I live across the ocean. Really? 